Today we're going to talk about Islamic architecture. I think that the topic of, of Islamic architecture is really going to be more germane to the general trajectory of material we've been covering. Because already in our discussion during the last couple of classes, we've been talking about different civilizations, different movements of populations, different values and beliefs that are emerging around the rim of the Mediterranean. And certainly Islam is a powerful force in all of that. The history of Islam rises up with the history of the life of Muhammad, who is a historical figure born in 570 CE. And he uh, had various episodes in his life involving exile and return to Mecca and, and initiating conquests of many, many territories surrounding his native lands. Uh, he died in 632 CE, and already shortly after his death, the first caliphate emerges. And the first caliphate continues the expansion of territories through jihad, or holy war, and uh, territories like Jerusalem and Damascus become incorporated into the um, expanded terrain of Islam. With the Umayyad caliphate of 661, to 750, there's a huge expansion of territory. Damascus is the capital, and here you can see the state of the spread of Islam during the Umayyad Caliphate. Here's the Byzantine Empire up here, and the Umayyad Empire is almost beginning to circle it, or at least to enclose it on several sides. Included among the territories that the Umayyad Empire has taken over are Spain and Portugal. And really, Spain, Portugal, Northern Africa, a lot of these countries had been Christian territories, and they had converted to Islam, and the architecture bears witness to these new influences. This is the Kaaba, a large rectilinear volume in the middle of the Grand Mosque of Mecca, it is the sacred center of Islam, and the Grand Mosque of Mecca is a place to which many, many pilgrims pay their homage. But rather than look specifically at this mosque, we will look at the type of mosque and variations on the theme of the type of mosque. I guess one thing that is important in understanding the ornamental pattern and the love of surface decoration is the tradition of forbidding figural images. There's a, a strong interest in geometric ornament. The word aniconic simply means not representing uh, the physiognomy of, of people, but rather favoring symbolic ways of representing things, like numer numerology or geometry or pattern making. So this is just a little diagram of what Islamic pattern making might look like. And you can see that it derives from a really strong geometric structure that gets overlaid and overlaid and overlaid. The square rotated on side of the square to begin to give you an octagon that might unfold in a florate pattern is something you see again and again and again. <clears throat> One of the most important sites in Islamic architecture is the Dome of the Rock. And this is quite early, uh, 691 to 692. And it's on a site that is sacred to the Jews, to the Christians, and to the Muslims. It's the site where, at least according to some biblical scholars, Isaac was offered for slaughter by his father Abraham. And it's, you can see the idea of a precinct, and inside the precinct there is this domed building that marks a spot. Domed building marking a spot, centralized plan. Where have we seen that before? Which architecture that we've looked at before strongly favors the idea of centralized plans? Any takers on that? I think you said Byzantine. Is that what you said? Yeah, that's right, right. <laughs> and I think when you said Greek, you meant Greek Orthodox churches and not Greek temples. That's, I'm, I'm believing you were both totally correct. I could barely hear what you had to say. So yeah, it picks up a lot on the, on the architecture of the Eastern Empire, and, and not surprisingly so. Here's the interior of the Dome of the Rock. And if you look at the interior of the Dome of the Rock, its correspondence to early Christian and Byzantine models, I think, comes, becomes even clearer, where we have this ring of columns with an ambulatory 
around which you can walk. There's a section or a, a cutaway axonometric of the Dome of the Rock. And really, its basic lineaments remind us of buildings we've seen before, such as San Vitale in Ravenna or Santa Costanza in, um, in Rome, the martyrium for the daughter of Constantine. Tall centralized space, ambulatory around it, and beautiful dome. If you even look at the kind of dome that's constructed over the Dome of the Rock, it will remind you more of Byzantine examples than of Roman examples. I have right next to it the Dome of the Hagia Sophia. And when we looked at the Hagia Sophia, we observed that there was this magical ring of windows that made the dome seem to float above the space but it wasn't really magic. It was a structural system that had to do with ribs carrying the load down. So a different structural system than, than the Romans would have used, which would have been horizontal stacking of elements. This is the vertical disposition of ribs. So there's a lot of borrowing between Byzantine models and the architects of the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. The type of the mosque is probably the most significant architectural type that we, we get out of Islamic architecture. It's a place to gather the faithful. It's a place to help orient people toward the direction of Mecca. It's a place that becomes symbolic and capable of organizing not only prayer but call to prayer through these tall spindly towers called minarets. And there are a couple of things that every mosque should have and it can be quite a humble thing. We could turn this room into a mosque if we oriented it correctly and made certain adjustments. For example, there should be a mirhab or a niche. And this is an element that, that is engaged on this major wall called, called the Qibla, facing east, and it organizes the direction of prayer. So we already know two things about Islamic architecture. One, it's very interested in the development of interior space because it has to provide sufficiently capacious spaces so that large crowds of people can come inside and worship. And two, it's really interested in providing some kind of directionality, some kind of graining through the site that emphasizes this, this very important direction around which prayer is or organized. And three, the kinds of celebrations that go inside a, a mosque are, are different from Christian celebrations. They don't involve the same kind of procession. They don't involve the same kind of pageantry. They really are more about the assembly of crowds, the assembly of people coming together to pray together. So other elements you have would be the minaret. And the minaret is the tall, spindly little tower. There would be someone call, coming up to the top of the minaret and making a call for prayer so that people can observe their daily prayers on schedule. So here, the Blue Mosque in Istanbul, which is an Ottoman structure from around 1550, has fairly normative minarets, little towers. The Great Mosque in Samarra, Iraq, has this minaret, which is astonishing. It almost looks like a ziggurat or some kind of Dairy Queen experiment gone terribly wrong. You need the mirhab, the niche, and the qibla, the wall, as we mentioned before. And you also need a courtyard for assembly and a fountain for ritual cleansing. So as we look at various permutations on the type of mosque, we'll begin to see these things played out in various ways. Probably the origin for the idea of the mosque the, the, and the constituent parts of the mosque comes back to Muhammad's house. And Muhammad's house is meant to have some kind of courtyard and a kind of wall that orients and so forth. So this very simple enclosure, almost a kind of hypostyle hall, becomes the constituent element to define the mosque form. And we can see an elaboration of this simple courtyard here in the Grand Mosque in Mecca, the holiest site. And again, this is the Kaaba, this cube-shaped object which dates from pre-Islamic times, but is considered to be one of the holiest things in Islam. Variations on the theme, Grand Mosque in Damascus, similar to a courtyard with interior space. And look at the plan of the Grand Mosque in Damascus. If you're used to looking at Christian church plans, it's a pretty strange looking plan. For example, well, it's axial. Christian church plans are frequently axial. It seems to have something 
that could be an aisle, something that could be a nave. But they're not really aisles and naves. They are striations of space. They're bands of space. And you don't proceed through the long direction of this series of, of bands of space, but rather you organize yourself against the eastern wall. So the people would be disposed in ranges in this fashion, moving through the short axis of the building rather than the long axis of the building. Over various periods in its history, the mosque in Damascus has undergone various forms. At one point, there was a little Christian basilica stuck inside. You can see how different the organization of this space is, where it's really directional, it's really hierarchical. There's a really strong difference between the beginning of the procession and the end of the procession, as opposed to the space of the mosque. And this is what it looks like on the inside, and I think this is pretty spectacular. And what I think is so spectacular about it is that it is so relentlessly iterative about these horizontal striations of space. You get band after band after band of these columnar rows. And unlike, say, a Roman space that might have a colonnade, the two rows of columns don't conjoin together to make a barrel vault or a groin vault, but they are really just lines cutting through the space and organizing the, the necessary directionality for the rituals. Another thing to observe is the degree to which this structure is dematerialized. We see columns with arches on top of them. And then on top of that colonnade, we see more columns with arches on top of them. So we have walls striating the space, but the walls are incredibly dematerialized. The walls are incredibly open to light and plays of shadow. And when shadow is cast on these strongly patterned devices, you get this virtual dematerialization of the floor as it is cut with different pattern-making shadows. There's another element, and this is still the uh, Great Mosque in Damascus, and that is these domes that appear occasionally. And notice the geometry of this dome. In part, it's one of those rib domes, the likes of which we saw in Hagia Sophia, and again at the Dome of the Rock. But it is not interested in expressing its structure. It's not interested in expressing its tectonic value, its value as heavy stone. Rather, it's completely covered over with surface ornament. And we saw already in uh, Byzantine architecture this preference for surface ornament and the denial of the plasticity of the wall. And here, I think it gets carried even further, because not only is pattern applied to the wall, but the wall itself becomes cut into with ornamental geometrical patterns. Here at the facade of the Great Mosque in Damascus, and in its general disposition of forms, it's kind of like a basilica. In the way ornament adheres to its surface, it is emphatically flat. You can see little variations on the pieces that you need to get a mosque. This is the plan of the Sheikh Lotfola Mosque in Isfahan. And here, there's a kind of rotation that happens. Because when we get to the sheltered part of the mosque over here, it's got to have the propitious orientation toward the east. The mirhab uh, has to organize toward the east, but the courtyard is engaged in this dense city, which has remnants of a Greek hippodamian gridded town plan. So the courtyard locks into this town plan, and the mosque rotates off. And it's really quite lovely how this vestibule becomes almost like a hinge to favor the rotation of the, of the building from one direction to another. Here's the big courtyard of a different mosque in Tunisia. We're becoming familiar with the typology. This is different from the Damascus Mosque. In the Damascus Mosque, we had the worship hall on the long end. Here we have the worship hall on the short end. It can happen wherever it needs to happen. Great Mosque in Isfahan. By the time we get here, the surface is completely overrun by the relentless uh, iterative pattern making. And it's, it's pattern not like, say, the Court of Justinian that we had on the walls of the San Vitale in, in Ravenna, but rather it's pattern that really becomes very dense and very tangled and very knot-like and really uh, keeps referring to general geometrical figures at smaller and smaller scales. So it's, 
it's simultaneously self-similar, because you see the same figure again and again and again, but also highly differentiated, because as the scale shift, the quality of the element shifts likewise. So these are just iterations of the mosque in Isfahan from an ideal condition to a condition that begins to negotiate with the boundaries of the city. And in many ways, it's like a fried egg scheme, the same kind of fried egg scheme we saw when we were looking at houses in Pompeii. Yeah, well, let's move to Moorish Spain, because these are buildings I've personally visited and love a great deal. In 1711, the Umayyad Caliphate invaded Spain and took over Spain and really occupied Spain for hundreds of years. Eventually, they were expelled by Isabel and Ferdinand, the same people who financed the expeditions of Christopher Columbus. But before then, they had really placed their influence on the architecture and culture of most of the Iberian Peninsula in a very, very strong way. And here's just a map. Here's Spain. And this map shows you the spread of Islamic culture during the Umayyad period. Probably the most important religious artifact that remains to us from the Islamic culture of Spain is the great mosque in Cordoba. And Cordoba is pretty much down here. And in fact, the area down here, Andalusia, was the last part of Spain to be overtaken by the, uh, the Christians. And it remained Muslim for maybe about 300 years more than the rest of Spain. This is the great mosque in Cordoba. It's an amazing plan. And here you see the kind of growth of the plan of the great mosque in Cordoba from an idealized condition. And as the needs grew to accommodate a larger population, so too did the mosque grow and grow and grow. It's kind of like the mosque that we saw in Damascus with these striations of space, these bands of space. But there, there were three bands of space. And here, there are many, 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 many bands of space. You can get a sense of what that spatial quality is if you look at the roof plan, almost like, like a train shed or something that you would imagine, uh, I don't know, lots of little trains being parked under here. But instead, there are just these rows and rows and rows of transparent screens that allow continuation among the rows, but also demark different zones. And here's another aerial view. And this aerial view begins to show you the courtyard, the court of oranges, which is another one of the constituent elements you need to have in a mosque. You need to have a courtyard where people can assemble and also where they can have ritual cleansing. So you look at this courtyard and you would have to say, my, but the climate in Cordoba must be very nice because things are growing beautifully there. But in fact, it's very, very hot, and it, you need to irrigate in order to grow. And one of the really great things that Islamic architecture does is it has figured out a way to build irrigation into the architectural design of projects in a way that doesn't disrupt the qualities of the space, like, say, a big sprinkler going wah, 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 but rather enhances the qualities of the space. So you can't see it from this aerial view. But if you get down to ground level, you can see that there's this grid of little cuts in the pavement. And water is channeled through here so that the entire pavement becomes a kind of fountain with these little narrow troughs, maybe six inches, easy to step over, but also very convenient for having a gravity feed of a very gentle slope that gets water to all the trees. And so you get these marvelous oasis-like gardens happening in places that you think nothing can grow of its own accord. We spoke about an iconic image making, this mistrust of the figural representation of people in favor of, of geometric pattern making. And this detail of the Great Mosque of Cordoba begins to show you how that affects the qualities of the architecture. You know, every possible color you can imagine is going on. The use of a lot of colors in architecture is called polychromy, poly meaning many, chromy meaning color, and Islamic architecture is highly polychromatic. We also see the arches, the voussoirs of the arches being polychromatic, and in the case of the arch over here, becoming kind of wildly figural, that pattern making, the kind of geometrical expansion of a simple motif that gives character to wall ornament 
now begins to spatially explode the figure of the arch and make it decorative in its shape and not simply in its color. And here's just another detail of some walls. It is astonishing. This kind of quality of pattern begins to make things not look solid. Here we have a view toward the mirhab, that niche in the important wall that, that organizes the interior space for prayer. And this is what it looks like on the inside. It's just spectacular. You have these red and white polychromatic arches, row after row after row after row, with the same unidirectional quality that we admired in the Damascus Mosque. These are also different from Roman arches in, in an important way. They are what we call historiated arches, if you want to use a word that you'll never need. And what that means is that they don't spring in such a way as to create half circles, but they rise up extra high. They're sort of like horseshoe arches rather than half circle arches. So they have different qualities than the Roman arches. And the qualities that they have make them more vertical. At the same time that the historiated arches are more vertical, you might be inclined to say, well, that's a bad idea. They're never going to get the same good structure that you get when you use something as perfect as a half circle. But in fact, these are structurally better than the round Roman arches. The round Roman arches really don't accommodate the lateral thrust of the arch very well within the geometry of the structure. And the historiated Islamic arches begin to rise up higher. Notice how the voussoirs are thicker on the top, thinner down here, and that's letting some of the loads transfer. Of course, the only way you can have this field of columns with arches above them is to allow the arch next door to be the bracing. Here's the little plan with all these little elements, and these are these horseshoe arches. And I think on the taller arch, you can see how it begins to become a geometry that's more suited to this accommodation of the, of the lateral thrust. Probably this way of making arches, this way of conceiving structure, this way of making a kind of diaphanous screen that's happening at this early date in Islamic architecture is something that inspired Gothic ar architecture toward this condition of dematerialization in later years. So something like this looks crazy, but in fact something like this is better structurally than a Roman arch because it's transferring the loads down and it's getting higher up. So the natural catenary of the arch is accommodated within the structure. I will demonstrate. This is a cable. The cable droops under its own weight and takes a shape. This is not drooping very well. It's a very wired up cable. But it, the, the shape that a cable takes while drooping under its own weight is the natural arch. And if you turn it in this direction, that would be the most efficient arch that you could have. The natural catenary of an arch is accommodated within these crazy looking horseshoe arches much better than within the round arches. Fabulous. And here's a little section through the area toward the mirhab. And, and suddenly toward the mirhab, something extraordinary is happening. This is the little niche, and this is what's happening in the ceiling plane above it. You're getting a series of domes. And they're strange little domes. You can tell already, looking at the section, the geometry of these domes is quite different than domes we've seen in Byzantine and Roman architecture. And that's because these domes are ribbed, for one thing, and they're funny ribs. They are these kind of rotated squares, the perimeters of which are articulated with ribs. And it gives you an octagonal star. And as is typical with ornament on a wall surface, there is this recursive play of geometrical figures. So we get the big octagonal star here, and in the space left at the center, a smaller, more dense kind of octagonal star dome piece emerges. So this diaphanous wall making that we saw with the rows of horseshoe arches delimiting the space of the mosque is taken three-dimensionally in this diaphanous dome making that we get at the mirhab. Remember these domes of the great mosque because we're probably going to see them again when we get to the Baroque period in the work of the Baroque architect Guarino Guarini, where you get exactly the same notion of these uh, octagons that thread together to make a star. These are domes, uh, mosques from the Ottoman Empire. And the Ottoman Empire 
more or less correspond with the Renaissance in terms of dates. So it's quite, quite recent, given the long arc of history of Islamic architecture and mosque making. And when you look at the plan of this mosque, of the cutaway axonometric of this mosque in Turkey, does it remind you of anything you've ever seen before? Yes. OK, it kind of looks like the Baths of Caracalla, insofar as there are lots of domed spaces and a courtyard. I think that's, that's fair to say. Anything else? Yes? It looks like Hagia Sophia. Yeah. But I, I think your comment was good, too, because if you cut off the domes and you don't see the interpenetration of the space, it could be anything. But when you put the domes on it, it really begins to become very much like the Hagia Sophia. Here's a plan of the Mosque of Suleiman the Magnificent. And when you look at the, the plan, you can begin to see a centralized space that is flanked by half domes clipping into it and surrounded by a habitable perimeter. And it's very much like the plan of the uh, Agia Sophia. Maybe idealized a little bit, maybe more rational, given the love of geometry in, in Islamic culture. And, and during this period, I might add, and even before this, during a period when Europe was hunkering down, fighting barbarians, trying to uh, keep culture alive by copying over Greek manuscripts again and again. There was a flourishing of arts and sciences in Islamic culture. So some of the great mathematics and mathematicians come from that period. The word algebra, for example, is a Arab word. The zero was invented by Arab mathematicians. And so there's a clarity about the geometry, precision of the proportion, and a legibility about qualities in something like the Mosque of Suleiman the Magnificent, while I would say the, the Hagia Sophia tends to, to deliberately baffle and overwhelm as part of its, its effect. Here's just another one of these Ottoman mosques. And this one is, again, looking a heck of a lot like Hagia Sophia. Here it's a Greek cross plan, where you have a circular center with half circles clipping in on four sides with little domes. At all. Let's look at a palace. Let's look at domestic architecture. Domestic if you happen to be really rich. And this is the Alhambra in Granada, Spain. This is a fortified castle. And again, it's in Andalusia in the southern part of Spain. And what's so wonderful about it is that it's not simply a building, but the boundary between landscape and architecture Seems, seems very loose, so that suddenly you're in a courtyard, suddenly you're in a garden, suddenly the roof has become a garden. And the section that is enforced by being on top of a hill is played off very effectively, so that views through the space and movement through the space allow you to experience this landscape on lo in lots of different ways. In fact, the whole idea of the garden is something that you see again and again in Islamic architecture, and it's always negotiating between a geometrical de definition of the garden and the kind of explosive fecundity of nature to replicate itself and, and become green. This is a Quranic description of paradise. It's not so different from the paradise garden that we hear about in, in the Old Testament with the rivers running out of the bounded precinct. But the image of the paradise garden is more emphatically deployed in Islamic architecture than in Christian architecture, especially in the gardens. Here's a site plan of the Alhambra. Big hill, big palace, and the rest of the town stretching out in the lowlands. This is the palace moving up the hill, and a figure ground. And I think this figure ground probably helps illustrate the argument I was making about how landscape and architecture move together. When you look at the figure ground, you can see that really there are a number of courtyards organizing fairly thin bands of program around them. And that these volumes are perched at the edge of the precipice so that they can begin to get these kind of dramatic views and capture the surrounding landscape as part of the purview of the building, as well as the kind of near landscape of the gardens that unfold on top of the plateau here. And here's a plan that shows you the uh, integration of water into the courtyards. This is the Court of the Myrtles, where there's a long, linear pool. And this is the Lion Court, where the device we saw at the Great Mosque in Cordoba is used here. 
linear troughs of water and a fountain in the middle. And this is really spectacular. It's really almost literal building of the model of the Paradise Garden. A bounded precinct with water crossing through it, subdividing its world into four quadrants with this little lion here. And these fountains uh, penetrate into these chambers on all sides and become fountains there too. It's really, really great. Here's the Myrtle Courtyard. And notice also the toughness of the exterior of the Alhambra because this building is almost like a geode. Do you know what a geode is? It looks like a rock on the outside and you crack it open and it's this kind of sparkling crystal. So you look at the exterior of the Alhambra and it seems <coughs> solid, it seems tough, it seems fortified. But when you crack it open, you get the same kind of light, diaphanous, dematerialized collection of screens that we observed in the mosques. This is just a drawing showing you how the lion courtyard works with these fountains and the lion fountain in the middle. And here is a section through the Myrtle Court. There are a number of sections through the Alhambra that are pretty interesting from a psychological point of view. Here from the Myrtle Court, they're showing you that you get the big view downhill. And you could be here in this place of perfect repose, in this chamber, admiring the garden, but you could be surveilling the landscape to see if any kind of intruders are coming. So you have these is vantage the section points that cuts stipulated through the throughout the building. Because in Islamic culture, there is a division between the space of the women and the space of the men. So the women are frequently segregated from the men, but have an opportunity to spy on them, which I think is great. So a lot of these permeable screens that we've seen uh, are deployed there to make it possible to hear and to see what's going on, but to be screened from view. So from the harem, there are these views across uh, the space of the courts of the ambassadors, across the gardens, and down the hill. So from that vantage point, you can see almost everything. Here's a detail of the fountain of the lions, and you can see these troughs of water that begin to issue forth and irrigate the garden and bring life to the garden. And when you crack through that tough masonry shell, you find this dematerialized, extremely light architecture. We saw in the Mosque of Cordoba the beginning of a kind of pointed archwork, this, this uh, horseshoe arch, or these various stepped arches. And it's becoming even more specifically pointed when we get to some of the courtyard arcades here at, uh, at the Alhambra. And the effect is really amazing, because you're in the shade, you're protected, but you have this kind of amazing transparency of view through the whole space. One more kind of architecture before we stop to look at your papers. Late Islamic architecture, or, or the Mughal gardens. When we looked at our map of the spread of Islam, we noticed that they were not simply moving towards Spain, but they were also moving toward India, into Bulgaria, into Pakistan, into Afghanistan. And, and some of the most remarkable examples of Islamic architecture are now in, in those areas, on the Indian subcontinent. Mughal If you look at Persian miniatures, for example, you find lots and lots of descriptions of gardens. And I think this analogy between paradise and the garden makes the garden such a provocative subject in Islamic architecture. This is a simple Mughal tomb in India, garden and tomb. Tomb in the middle, the diagram. And it's a diagram that you see again and again and again in Islamic architecture. It is the diagram of the paradise garden, the four-square grid with a fountain in the middle. It's the diagram of the lion court. And the powerful quality that the four-square grid has in Islamic architecture is its ability to constantly replicate itself at different and denser scales. So if you begin to look at this very simple Islamic garden plan over here, you already see the same strategies that you got in pattern making on the wall, where a geometrical device is deployed and then redeployed at a denser, smaller scale inside the original figure again and again and again. And that happens all the time. These are comparative tombs in India where the <coughs> nesting of recursive geometries happens insistently with great vigor. And probably the most famous of all of these these 
gardens or funerary complexes is the Taj Mahal in Agra. And notice the dates are quite late, given the dates that we've been looking at before. But there is a kind of conservation of type that goes on. Many of the things we're seeing here, like the minarets, or the domes, or the giant cut-out arches with highly patterned surfaces, are things that we saw from mosques 800 years before this. Here's the general layout of the garden plan of the Taj Mahal. And oh my goodness, it's a paradise garden. Look at that. The plan of the Taj Mahal itself, the structure, becomes another recursion of the overall plan of the garden. And even the plan of the towers of the Taj Mahal become a denser, smaller, more tightly knit together recursion of the overall plan of the, the garden itself. Islamic architecture begins to show you an influence that is reacted to and folded into the developments of architecture as we move forward from the Romanesque into the Gothic in, in our discussions. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that there were increasing contacts between people in, in Western Europe and people in the Holy Lands through things like the Crusades, for example, but also through things like trade. The Silk Route, for example, had opened up, and there were lots and lots of kind of mercantile parties cutting through these territories, bringing back spices, bringing back silk, bringing back goods, and observing this kind of architecture. And I think you, if you see the architecture of these, these lacy pattern screens, and you see how light and spectacular the qualities are, it would be very difficult to, to ignore that influence and keep plowing ahead with dark, sad little Romanesque buildings.